Welcome back to another episode of the Care to Listen podcast. In this episode, I'm joined by Stacey Ashton, the chair of the BC Crisis Line Network and executive director of the Crisis Center in BC. We discuss the lessons Stacey has learned throughout her career and the importance of staying soft in the face of difficult circumstances. Today's episode is being broadcasted to you on the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Trigger warning. This podcast discusses topics that may be triggering for some viewers, including suicide and loss. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Care to Listen podcast. Today I'm joined by an amazing guest, Stacey Ashton, who's the Executive Director of the Crisis Centre of BC. Welcome to the show, Stacey. Oh, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. So being in your role, you know, you, you're able to support so many different people. Could you maybe share a little bit about, you know, what the Crisis Centre of BC does? Yeah, absolutely. So we've been around for over 50 years, um, taking calls from people in distress. So we have two big things that we do. Um, One is we operate 24-7 crisis lines, the 1-800-SUICIDE line and 310-6789, the provincial mental health line. And we also do a lot of training in the communities and in workplaces. We train police and social workers and teachers in how to identify signs of uh, somebody who might be thinking about suicide, um, training in how to de-escalate crisis instead of make it worse, uh, and, uh, and how, to, how to regulate your own emotions when you're, you're feeling uh, intense feelings. That's such an important, you know, a skill to develop and build over time and you know, in particular, I think you see so many of the different challenges that as society we've had to navigate through the pandemic and then now um, the endemic and how that transition, people transition back into their whatever a normal sense of life is. Mm-hmm. I'm curious, you know, what sort of changes have you seen evolve over the past, you know, three to five years in, in the role that you've played? Mm-hmm. Well, I think what's been really striking uh, over the period of COVID is how much more willing we were able to talk about and admit to our own mental health challenges. Uh, And what that's led to is a real increase in the number of calls to the line as people were more comfortable reaching out for help. Um, They felt like the crisis and the stresses and the mental health issues that they were facing were... Uh, not really something to be ashamed about as much and really something that, you know, they would be willing to reach out to get help for, which is really the culmination of everything we've been working towards is let's reduce that stigma. So when people are in pain, they can reach out. Absolutely. And even going as far as, you know, talking about the humanizing the experience and how, you know, one day you might be struggling, but the next day, you know, you might be able to get through that and, and move forward and help someone else. And when you have so many competing priorities, whether it's, you know, you've mentioned as well in your articles, operational efficiencies and the need for um, systematic change when it comes to enabling or empowering people to stay soft mm-hmm. versus, oh, I just got to get this done. Mm-hmm. Or here's an expectation that I need to get all of these tasks finished before the end of my shift. Yeah. How does one navigate and balance some of those competing or conflicting priorities? Yeah, well, I think what's what is um, really key around this is, uh, and now that I've been an ED, I've been the ED at the crisis center for five years, and I've seen you know coming back twenty years out later. Um, and seeing that the culture of the crisis center hadn't changed, seeing that, yes, everything is busier, there's more calls, uh, but the, the commitment to staying soft and present hadn't changed. Uh, and that's because operationally we rely on volunteers. And if you put your volunteers in situations where they have to shut down their emotions, uh, they aren't going to stay. They're going to leave. So the entire organization in some ways becomes centered on uh, supporting and protecting your volunteers so that they can do their work. Uh, In most of the uh, paid positions that I had in in mental health and healthcare, um, we had to start with efficiency. We had to start with um, operational demands and the staff were there to serve the operational demands. Um, And, uh, you know, if we didn't like it, well, we would get fired and wouldn't get paid. So there was a completely different incentive to, to be there and a different, a different way that 
uh, our, the organization as a whole could treat us um, that you wouldn't get away with with volunteers. Hmm. Uh, and all of the way that when you get operational efficiency driving the bus, I think what happens is there's there's so much so much requirement to get things done that you have to cut corners with the time you spend with people. And you know in your heart that that's not going to necessarily be what's needed. It's not how you would want to be treated if you were in a, in a crisis. Um, but operationally, you have to. And to do that, you have to harden. You have to start defending yourself against the pain of people because you don't have time to be with it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's really an operational efficiency problem that most healthcare have and most healthcare workers end up working inside that system. So if there were, you know, let's say volunteers that were willing to work inside the hospitals mm -hmm. to work alongside those nurses or other professionals, do you see that as potentially being a solution to support this protection of what it means to stay soft? Well, we've seen that work. I, I ran uh, my organization, I ran a volunteer center in Coquitlam, and our organization ran the volunteer program for the Cottonwood and Connolly Lodges on the Riverview grounds. And so those were, like, that supported residential housing for folks with severe mental illness. And um, uh, our volunteers were were the people who had time. The nurses didn't have time to, to really invest a lot of time with an individual, but that's our volunteers' job. So we would have volunteers who could sit next to the new resident uh, in the lodge and just color beside them, right, for, for their entire shift for mm. three hours, yeah. right? And at the end of that, that person, you know, would have had just that parallel play process that you can have. Um, they weren't able to verbalize it, but then by the end of that, they were able to talk and to say thank you for, for just slowing down and being with me. Um, that's not something that you can do as a healthcare worker very often, um, but when you have volunteers involved who can do it, it, it changes the tone of a place, right? The value of spending time becomes more obvious, and even if you can't do it, you want to protect the people who can. Um, so I think the first piece of it is, you know, when you, if you're, if you're in education, if you're learning, if you're coming into your first workplace, if you've been in a workplace for a long time, um, don't let anybody take that softness away. Um, it's not weakness. It's not naivete. It is your superpower. It's why you got into this work in the first place. Um, but also recognize that there are many, many pieces of the work that, um, you know, and the way that our organizations set are set up that uh, will will try and take that away from you, mm -hmm. right? And I find it's not useful to get angry about that. It's the nature of the system, right? The system needs to push for efficiency. It's doing that out of the best of intentions. The more efficient you are, the more people you can help, supposedly. Um, but it's also the more efficient you are, the more quickly you can cause harm. Yeah. So you have to figure out a balance for yourself in that space where you recognize that the, 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 the system that you're in is going to really drag you towards hardening that the role that you have in the system is to stay soft and to force it to stay soft with you. Absolutely. And, you know, then taking that one step further, we're talking about supporting patients um, in the healthcare industry. And then if we were to, to flip it where the healthcare provider becomes the patient mm -hmm. or is struggling, you know, what sort of, I guess, advice or what sort of guidance would you typically offer to somebody in that situation or maybe it's advocacy work that you'd be doing yeah. um, in that profession yeah well I think you know if you are in if you're struggling it's a lot of that will be because you're a human being and um, part of that will be from the the stress of the job and the kind of the 
the accumulated stress of being forced to be hard when you what you actually need is some care and support. Uh, and the and the the magic of of being able to talk to your peers about what's going on, which is a lot of what Care to Listen is about. Uh, people who understand and are also alongside you in the path of trying to do good in imperfect systems. So you are on that same path. Um, and then that will combine with, you know, like all of our lives have tragedies and hardships and difficult times uh, and complexities. So figuring out how to forgive yourself for your life being difficult and complicated and and finding help, which if you're in the healthcare profession, profession you know takes persistence because you don't always get help the first time. You see that all the time, right? And that care to speak line that you talked a little bit about, um, maybe could you just walk the listeners through a little bit of like what they might expect if they, mm-hmm. they call in? Yeah, well, it's very similar to a crisis line, really. So, you know, what what works for folks when they are, you know, in pain uh, and in crisis and they're not sure what to do next or they're overwhelmed with whatever their emotions are and a panic attack or anything like that is you can call a crisis line and our job is to just slow things down, right? Well, Mm. let's talk about how you're feeling. Um, How are you feeling and what's that coming from, do you think? And, uh, and, and, And really just talk it through a little bit so that, you know, you can put your feelings to the side and then you can start thinking about, okay, what do I want to do about these feelings? Um, the, the thing that's different between a peer line and a crisis line is that everybody on that peer line has, does the same kind of work that you do, has had similar experiences, understands what it's like. And from the care to speak line, in terms of like the depths of you know, challenges or issues that somebody might be dealing with, is there a threshold or, you know, what, what types of calls would be fielded through that, that specific line? When you, whenever you're doing a a line like that, you have to be prepared for anything, right? So when we train our, our volunteers, we're training them how to be present in, you know, if somebody is, has called to tell you that they're in the process of killing themselves, to, you know, they called to tell you that they've broken their heart for the first time, right? You, yeah. you, you, you're prepared for everything, but you use the same tools, right? You use the same tools of let's slow this crisis down, let's talk it through, let's give you space to have some thoughts about what you want to do next instead of just acting out of impulse. Um, and uh, let's kind of open up your options, like healthcare provision, for example, you know, like the, you can get locked into saying, thinking, well, I have to keep, keep this job because if I don't, you know, I'm going to be homeless on the street myself. I'm like, well, that may be true, but there's probably some options that you can explore before things get that dire. Absolutely. Probably. Not promising it, because I don't know, but once you can kind of get a, more of a picture of your life together, you can start finding solutions. You, you're not the first person to have this human experience, no matter how much despair or pain you're in. So that means that a peer or a crisis line, we, can, we can't feel what you're feeling, but we, we know it's possible. And with the line itself and the crisis line, I'm curious, like, are there any trends when it comes towards healthcare workers or anything like that that you know, would be relevant to share or just... Yeah, well, I think, you know, one of the things I try and look for is when things are moving in the right direction. So when I see something like um, WorkSafe BC uh, recognizing PTSD as a, as a, as, as a, something you don't actually have to sit down and prove, right? Like you don't have to show, like, you know, if you have a broken leg, that's really easy to prove. But if you have a mental health issue and you're going on um, disability, that's much harder to prove. But for emergency responders, um, you know, WorkSafe waived the requirement to prove uh, because the assumption was that, yeah, you know, if you've been exposed to enough trauma in your work and then you have a trauma reaction, that's probably because of work and not because of your regular life. Mm -hmm. 
just like if you were a sawmill, you worked in a sawmill uh, and now you have lung problems. Yeah, that's the sawmill. Yeah. Right. And they just, you know, you don't have to prove it. You're, those kinds of things are, are huge steps in recognizing the, the mental health toll that these, this work can have on us. And as you see more recognition of that in the workplaces, then you have more opportunities to find ways to build support. And you can move away from the position that, well, if you were tough enough, then you could be an ambulance, a paramedic. If you were tougher, you could be a nurse. If you were tougher, you could be a youth worker. How much of culture is creating that sense of psychological safety? How important is culture in the workplace? It is pretty important. I think, though, the thing to remember is that every single person is a part of influencing that culture. So um, I find like now that there are more younger folks coming into the workplaces, they, there is more of a just a, a gut sense that their psychological wellness is important in a way that, you know, when I was, you know, that would have been a that was not a, a given when I went into the field that my psychological wellness was important, right? Because I'm dealing with people who are suicidal. Clearly, their psychological wellness is the important thing here. But as new workers come in and they're and are like, well, you know, I can't do this work if if I'm not safe, you begin to have um, changes have to happen to the culture. And so what I find is every time you have somebody say, well, I'm on antidepressants too. Like I have depression, I have anxiety, it's managed, I can work, but it's there. Like like that's my situation. Um, the more you have people say that, the more it gives permission for other people to, to display their softness. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how you change culture. Yeah. And it sounds too like, there is, you know, it's the 10 year overnight success story or mm -hmm. the way that you explained it being a bit more, you know, it's, it's coming, it's coming. And then when it comes, it's, it's really here. Yeah. Um, that advocacy work, I think as a healthcare listening, what sort of advice do you have for them who maybe wants things to be done differently? Um, how can they be an advocate for their colleagues or for what they maybe need? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, well, there's some really interesting, the UK has this really interesting um, change maker program that I took a while back, um, where it, it really is just, okay, so you want to make change in, in that case, the UK's National Health Service. It's big. It's hard yeah. to change. How do you do that in the position that you have? And kind of recognizing there's positional power, like in terms of I'm a manager, I'm an executive director, but there is also social power that you have among your colleagues and that that can actually be the things that drive a lot of the day-to-day -day practices in any center. So it's, you know, being clear in your mind about what you would, what you want to see happen in your workplace and in your role and then how do you how do you find allies to create that how do you work the systems you're given how do you work the joint occupational health and safety committee to get that that end meet how do you work your annual performance reviews to get that how do you do some report or get a summer student involved to help you move that forward um, that's a uh, that's how you make change in an organization. Um, and, uh, and again, it's frustrating. It's, 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 it's not easy, but if you expected it to be easy, then I'm not sure if you were paying attention. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so much of, I think what you're saying too, it resonates with myself having worked at a, a large organization prior to this. And it was that sense of being an entrepreneur. So although, you know, these were more grassroots movements from the ground up, it was really about trying to continue to be an advocate for here's what we need or here's something that's missing and continuously having those conversations mm -hmm. or bringing somebody else on, on board or being creative really yeah. in expressing your needs. So it yeah. definitely sounds 
Well, this has been such a great conversation. I know that, you know, we could we could dig into so many diff- more different concepts or ideas. I'm curious, do you have anything that we haven't discussed that, you know, is top of mind or any advice that, you know, we haven't covered that maybe you'd want to, to share with our listeners? I think, um, you know, when I when I speak, I don't ever mean to diminish the 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 pain and of vicarious trauma, the the ex, the difficulty of facing despair in your own workplace. Like these are, um, I remember once somebody told me that they they thought I was naive because I because I had hope for these things, and I said I'm not naive. I'm strategically optimistic. Right. Yeah. I understand how hard this work is. I don't think it's going to be easy. I think it is an ongoing test of our humanity. Um, but again, if if you signed up to help others, there was a part of you that expected that. But if you don't want to do that anymore, that's okay too. Right. <laughs> right? You don't have to. Right. You can spend your life doing whatever you want. And, you know, and it's not a, it's not a failure to choose something different. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's a choice. It's a choice. Uh, so I, I make that choice because honestly, I can't think of anything else I would rather do with my life, but that's not the choice I would expect everyone to want to make. Absolutely. And if there's something that I'm listening to is that, you know, my big takeaway from today's conversation is that that need to continue to stay soft, mm-hmm. um, to come with that compassionate approach towards putting yourself in the best possible situation to serve your patients and doing that means you know you need to take care of yourself as well yeah if you need to take a break yeah I burned out and left for a year or two so it's totally fine (laughs) absolutely well with that we really appreciate you Stacey coming in today sharing all of your knowledge um, all the great work that, that you and your organization is doing it's you know something that as society, I think we could all be champions and advocates that, you know, we'd love to see more funding go your way. Um, we'd love to see, you know, more ways that you can continue to serve the community. Um, but we're really grateful for what you currently are doing. So thank you very much for taking the time today. Thank you. I appreciate uh, being asked. Thanks. Thanks for listening to this episode. Be sure to visit the links in the show notes for resources and supports from the Care for Caregivers program. If you're interested in sharing your story on the Care to Listen podcast, please reach out to us at careforcaregivers.ca forward slash podcasts. And don't forget to follow us on your favorite podcast platform to be notified when new episodes are released. Thanks again for joining us and see you next month.